And uh, down there in uh, Galatians chapter 6, I'd like to look at verse number 7, where it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now, this is a concept that you know most people are familiar with, even people that are unsaved are familiar with, that when you do something good, usually something good will come your way, something bad, something bad will happen to you. And you know, a lot of people will call it, refer to this as karma, you know, people who are unsaved, you know, or, or people that are worldly or whatever. But the Bible's concept of this is that of reaping what you sow. You know, it's the idea if you take a seed and you plant that, well, it's gonna come back and you're gonna get you know, whatever consequence of that, whether it be good or bad. And here we can see that there are both that we will receive. In verse eight he says, For he that soweth to his flesh, which is bad shall of the flesh reap corruption, which is also bad. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So, you know, you sow bad things, you're going to get bad consequences. You sow good things, you're going to get good consequences. You know, we're all going to have both. And tonight I'd like to talk about a certain way of reaping. And that is reaping what you sow through your children, the next generation. Because, you know... Sin doesn't just stop with us. It doesn't just affect us only. We don't just reap consequences and affects ourselves. It'll also reach into other people, and especially, you know, the people that are closest to us, like our children, right? Amen. And you can turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 25, and I'm going to read to you a verse uh, in Numbers chapter 14, verse 18. So you're turning to 2 Chronicles chapter 25. This is Numbers 14, verse 18. It says... The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. So this verse is talking about basically the next generation, the children receiving consequences for what their parents or their father has done. And, you know, this is the concept that I want to be dealing with tonight and basically how our sins as a parent can affect the next generation. And you might look at this and, and think, well, that doesn't seem quite fair. You know, someone, you know, being punished for someone else's, you know, sin or, or, or having that, that consequence on themselves and they haven't done anything. Well, look down at your Bible at 2 Chronicles 25. Because, see, there's a couple of elements here. There's the element of, you know, God has set up things as, in a cause and effect way. You know, if you commit a sin, it's just going to have ripple effects and it's going to just affect other people automatically because it's just the way God has set things up to be. It's not even necessarily God doing it, but other times God will go out of His way to make sure that someone is being punished or cursed because of sin. And in verse, or in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 1, it says, Amaziah was 25 years old when he began to reign and he reigned Twenty and nine years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jehoiada of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. Now it came to pass, when the kingdom was established to him, that he slew his servants that had killed the king his father, but he slew not their children, but did as it is written in the law in the law of Mo, the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, saying, The father shall not die for the children, neither shall the children die for the fathers, but every man shall die for his own sin. So what I think, you might look at these two verses and think, well, this is some type of contradiction, you know. Maybe an atheist or somebody who doesn't know much about the Bible would say, well, these are completely different things. But what's happening here, in verse 14 we see, okay, the sins of the fathers are being taken out, the consequences are being reaped through the children. The children are being punished for the sins of the fathers. And then you look at this verse, you say, well, no, every man's going to die for his own sin. And which makes more sense. But how do these, how is this not a contradiction? How can you reconcile the two? Well, what I think often is the solution to this is that the children learn and then repeat the sins of the Father. And that's the title of this sermon, The Sins of the Fathers. And we're going to look at how the sins of the fathers, and not just the fathers, but also just the parents, right? And how it affects and can curse the next generation. And uh, so, you know, you can have a situation be where, you know, this, a, a, ch a child or someone is cursed by or, or affected by their, their parent's sin 
and but maybe they're a baby. Maybe they haven't committed any sin. And you know, you can have it be where they're a victim to sin. But whenever you know, but whenever God is going to go out of His way to punish someone, I believe it's primarily because they have their own sin, and you know, they're being punished for their own sin. But yet, it's still you know, you know, intertwined with their father's sin because it's the same exact sin because they learned it. They, you know, we do what we see, right? And in Romans chapter five. You can go ahead and turn to Proverbs chapter 22. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 it says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Well, some people say, well, because of Adam's sin we're all damned, you know, because you know, he screwed it up for us all. Well, look at the next phrase, because he says, you know, where he says, and so death passed upon all men. Well, why? For that all have sinned. So, you know, we're not, I'm not going to be punished, or I'm not going to, I wouldn't go to hell because of something that Adam did. I would go to hell because of my own sins. Obviously, there's salvation. You know, Jesus paid for our sins. You believe on Him, you know, you'll be saved. But still, we will receive consequences for our own sin. And even in this life, we will reap what we sow. Physical consequences in this life. Yeah, I had you turn to Proverbs 22. If you want to write anything down or take notes off of this sermon, you write down the statement, the sins of the fathers are often learned by the children. This is something we need to remember. The sins of the fathers are often learned by the children. Proverbs 23, verse 26 says, My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Now this is a righteous father, a wise father, who's doing what's right. And he said, hey, look at what I'm doing, and do what I'm doing. Right. Now, It'd be nice if we could say the same thing to our children. Hey, look at me. Look at my example and do like what I'm doing. But you know what? This is going to happen whether you're given a good example or not. They're going to, your children are going to observe your ways and they're going to replicate and emulate you. And they're going to be like you. So if you want your children to, to turn out right, well, you need to set a high standard for yourself so that you can say, hey, look at me and be like me, son, daughter, right? In, verse, in, in chapter 22 of Proverbs, where I had you turn, verse 24, it says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go. Well, why? Why do we not want to have you know, angry friends or friends that are getting into this or that they're just identified and characterized by, as an angry person? Because lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. So if, you have, if you're surrounded by angry people or an angry person, well, you know what? You're probably going to learn his ways, and the same snare that he's getting unto himself, you're going to get the same snare. You're going to get into the same trap. And, you know, and you can choose who your friends are, but you can't choose who your parents are or who raises you, right? You know, if your father is an angry man, well, don't you think you're probably going to learn those ways? Don't you think you're probably going to get a snare to your soul, and you're going to learn the same thing? And then you're going to see this verse and numbers be fulfilled, the sins of the fathers... You know, the iniquities of the father is being taken out uh, on the children because they're doing the same thing. All right. Also, uh, in Proverbs 13, 20, it says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. You know, it, it reminds me of that old saying, you know, you lay down with dogs, you're going to get fleas. You are a combination of the people or the company that you keep. All right. And if you want to be wise, you should be around wise people or smart people. You know, if you want to be a fool or if you want to have problems, you know, that a certain person has, well, spend, spend some time with them. And you're, you're going to rub off on each other and you're going to emulate and be like each other. It's just part of human nature, especially when you're a child. You know, in Proverbs 22, where, you're, where you are in verse 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, parenting is very much a cause and effect type of relationship. You know, a lot of people today don't want to take responsibility for their children or how they turn out. I don't know how they turned out that way. You know, I didn't raise them to do that. I didn't show them to do that. Well, well did, did you? Because you probably did, actually. You know, you know, I'm not saying that there can't be the situation where a parent does everything right, they're righteous, they're, you know, you know, and, and the child just still goes to the devil, they still turn out bad. Because the Bible does talk about that as being an exception to the rule. But the vast majority of the time, it's cause and effect. What you show them, what you teach them, is what they're going to do. And that's just, and you know, I don't want to look for an excuse for my son to turn out horrible. 
I want to, you know, take the responsibility and do my best for him to turn out right. You're right. And uh, in Lamentations 3.51, we see this uh, type of a concept repeated where it says, Mine eye affecteth mine heart because of the daughters of my city. You know, what we see affects our heart. What, you're, what you show your children affects their heart. Whether it be what you do or what you show them or what you're consenting. You take them somewhere and they see something. You don't want to take them to a bar, even though you're not drinking. What are they going to learn? You know, they're going to learn that there. You don't want to put them in front of the TV where they're seeing all the adultery and the murder and the drinking. Was, even though you're not doing those things, you're showing it. And they, their eye is going to affect their heart. And in Acts 4, verse 20, it says, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. You know, what you know, monkey see, monkey do. Right? I mean, you know, <laughs> that's just how we are, you know, and... We need to remember that as parents because we have a great power, a great responsibility when it comes to our children. And you know, and you can apply this to other areas. And you can apply it to your friends. You can apply it, you know, apply it to just your, your co-workers or whatever. But today I want to primarily be applying it to the greatest influence that you know, someone could have over someone, and that is being their parent. You know, and I want to take the time now to look at a scriptural example of this taking place throughout the Bible because we saw the verse in Numbers 14 where it says, you know, where it says the iniquity of the fathers, uh, he's going to visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. So the sins that your great grandfather did is going to affect you basically. And there's a really good example of this happening in the Bible with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and I'm going to use Judah. Because you can look at a sin that Abraham had and it's exactly repeated Oma, you know, with Isaac and then Jacob and then Judah. And you can see, you know, you can learn some things from this. You can see how this uh, works. So if you want to turn to Genesis chapter 12, we're going to look at an example of how the iniquities of the fathers are going to be visited on the third, even unto the fourth generation. In Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1, it says... Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make, thee, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So God tells him, look, you know, I want you to go to this certain land that I'm going to show you, right? And I'm going to bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. So God's basically already saying, hey, look, I'm going to look out for you. I'm going to protect you. You don't have to worry about, you know, when you're traveling, someone doing something to you. I'm looking out for you, right? And then he gets another promise. Uh, look at verse 7. It says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. You know, and uh, so basically he said, hey, your seed, your you know, descendants are going to inherit this land. Well, Abraham, or Abram at the time, who he was called, he didn't have any children at this time. Right? And this is going to be relevant because later in the story, it's like Abraham is like, all this just goes over his head. Because he's like, okay, I'm going to go to the land. But then later it's like he has a complete relapse of faith, it seems. And, you know, in verse 10... It says, And there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down into Egypt, sojourned there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near into Egypt, to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they, sh and they will kill me. But they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. So Abraham, or Abram at the time, he tells his wife, hey, look, you're really good looking, right? So, I, you know, people are going to look at you and they're going to be like, hey, we're going to kill him so we can have his wife. So just tell them that, you're, that we're just brother and sister. That way I don't have to die for you. Well, that sounds like a really good husband, doesn't it? I mean, I, just, just go ahead and lie. We're, you know, no, I don't know who she is. Yeah, we're related, but, you know, you could, kinda, you could have her or whatever. I mean, that's horrible. 
okay? And he's just lying because they're married, right? And, you know, is he looking out for her when he's doing this? He's looking out for number one, right? Well, well what did God just tell him? He just told him, look, I'm going to bless you I'm gonna, and I'm going to curse those that curse you, right? And your seed is going to inherit this land. Well, they don't even have a seed. So if he was going to be killed, then God would be a liar. Because who's going to inherit the land if he's killed because they want his wife? So, I mean, just complete lack of faith here. Just lying, taking things into his own hands. You know, let's continue. And, uh, well, I'll skip down to verse, uh, verse 18. Basically, you know, they find out that, you know, he is not just her sister. Because it says in verse 18, Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidst thou she is my sister, so I might have taken her to me to wife? Now therefore, behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. Okay, so you see this, you see him sin, right? You see him just, just deliberately deceive people and lie. And you know, you could see how he could, you know, convince himself. It's like, well... It's okay because technically she is my sister. You know, we'll see that later. You know, turn to uh, Genesis chapter 20. Because this wasn't just a one-time deal. This is just something that Abraham told his wife to do every time. Hey, whenever we're going anywhere, this is just what we're going to do. So it wasn't like he just slipped up. This is like, no, we're going to do this every time. He's just making plans like this date, we're gonna, I'm going to commit this sin every time. Okay. And... Uh, Genesis chapter 20 says, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said, unto, uh, said of Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. Again. And Abimelech king of Gerar sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Well, this is God doing what he said he was going to do. So, I mean, do you really think God was, would have allowed Abraham to be killed if he had just said, hey, this is my wife and you're not going to touch her? When God just said, look, I'm going to curse them that curse you. Anyone who tries to hurt you, you know, they're going to have a problem with me, right? He, you know, he should have just t said the truth, right? But look what it says in verse 10. Because he says in verse 10, And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. So, he, you know, he's a little bit inbred, and he married his half-sister, right? So he could say, well, you know, she is my sister, but so it's technically not a lie, but we're just going to leave out the whole thing how we're married, so I'm not going to be killed. Well, uh, that's, that's wicked, though. Because he just didn't believe God. Well, look how, look later in the story when he had, when they finally have their son Isaac. Look how Isaac does the exact same thing. In Genesis chapter twenty-six, if you could turn there. Genesis twenty-six, it says, "And there was a famine in the land." Sound familiar, right? And uh, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham, and Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. Same guy, same place. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and, I, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed will I give all these countries. I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. It's the same thing. So he's got the blessing of God. Look, you don't have to worry. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to bless you. And, uh, <clears throat> and I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Okay. Now, in verse 7 it says, And the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, well, She is my sister. Well, is that true? For, you know, what was the reason? For he, for he feared to say, She is my wife. Lest, he said, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. Exact same thing. Well, she, yeah, hey, Rebekah, you, you look really good. You know, so hey, I got an idea. I remember what my dad used to do. He used to just tell everybody that mom was his sister. That's a good. I'm gonna just go ahead and do the same thing. But see, this is taking it a step further, because see, they're not even like half sisters. She's his cousin, right? It's just an outright lie. Well, you know what? Again, this is not 
an ideal husband. You know, a loving husband. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and lied about it so he wouldn't, you know, die for it. Is that what it said? No. It says, and gave himself for it. You know, husbands are supposed to be willing to die for their, for their wives, not lie about their wives and say, that, oh, we're not even married and risk them being defiled by some other man just because they're afraid. I mean, that's right after they were, you know, promised by God. Well, I wonder where Isaac learned this from. I mean, he probably learned it from dad. It's pretty specific. It's the exact same thing. History repeats itself. And uh, the consequences that Abraham would have received are the same consequences that we're going to see Isaac receive. Except he takes it a step further because he just outright lies. And, uh, you know, here's another statement you can write down. The sins of the fathers are often taken to the next level by the children. So not only are the sins of the fathers often learned by the children and just repeated and replicated, but as we see here in the story of Abraham and Isaac, they're often taken to the next level. Because we're not, you know, you, you see how, you know, with Isaac, it, it, was, it was a worse sin. It was a, it was a greater lie. And, you know, another example I could think of in the Bible where the, the, the children or the son takes, takes it to the next level is with uh, King David and Solomon. You know, King David, you know, he had multiple wives. He had, you know, you know 20 or however many wives. I can't remember the exact number. But Solomon... He, he, he sees that, hey, I'll raise you a thousand. Or, you know, he has 700 wives and 300 concubines. He just took what his dad did and he ran with it. I mean, that's taking it to the next level. And that's wicked. You know, God said that, you know, kings should, you know, never have more than one wife, that they're not supposed to multiply wives. So we need to be aware of this and we need to, you know, take heed to these things and realize. Whatever you're doing, you know, your pet sin that you're just openly going to do and you're planning on doing it like Abraham, well, your, your son, your daughter, they're going to probably see that, they're going to learn that, and they're probably going to take it to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. And unless you want, because see, we're going to get into what happens with Rebecca and Isaac, and they have a messed up marriage. Because see, you reap what you sow. And we're going to see how Isaac reaped what he sowed. Because, you know, you want to go out and you want to deceive people, you want to lie, looking out for number one, well, that might just cause some resentment in your wife. When you have that little love and self-sacrificial love for your wife, maybe she might just say, well, I'm going to look out for me. Because what happens later, they have two sons. They have you know, Jacob and Esau, right? Well, you know, Isaac's favorite son was, was uh, Esau. He wanted to bless Esau. Well, Rebekah's favorite son was Jacob. So, you know, she wanted him to get the blessing. So she was willing to deceive her own husband, go through this whole charade where they trick him and to just blessing the wrong son. I mean, how wicked. Wonder why she did that. Wonder what would cause that. Well, maybe because he did it every time they went somewhere. So, I mean, you could see how these things directly play into each other. And, and then uh, and old Jacob, you know, he learns it from his dad, I'm sure, and his mom. Because, you know, he's right there with her. You know, he's not guiltless. And you can see it. We're already three generations into it. If you want to turn to uh, Genesis chapter 27, we're going to see what happens later with Isaac. In verse 1, And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim, so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old, and I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray, thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison, and make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau his son, and Esau went to the field uh, to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee, Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. So she goes through this whole thing. Say, hey, I want you to be blessed, Jacob. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to you know, get these you know, from the flock. He's out hunting. And we're going to go ahead. I'm gonna, I know how he likes it, so I'm going to make it that way. You're going to present it to him as Esau, lying to your father. Who, you know, an old man you can't even see. That's pretty messed up. I'd say that's taken to the next level. 
So they're not in alliance with someone who's outside of the family now. They're just lying to their own family members now. And I think that's, I think it's worse. You know, the Bible says we should honor our father and mother. It's not very respectful when, you know, you're going to go and, you know, lie and deceive your father in this way. And um, so, basically, they go through this whole charade. They get these, they get the hair. Let's see where we're at here. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so basically, you know, he, Jacob deceives, you know, the father here, Isaac, and because of that, you know, he there's this enmity created between him and his brother Esau. So his mother tells him, "Hey, just go flee and live with my brother Laban," right? And so he goes and he does that. And uh, but see, you know, Jacob he doesn't get off he doesn't get off scot free either because you know he does. He has his own reaping. You know, he's, he's basically taking the same sin of Abraham and Isaac, and he just went even further with it by deceiving his own father and doing this whole charade where, hey, I'm going to put the fur on my hands and on my neck, and I'm going to just continuously lie to my father when he's asking me point blank, are you, are you Esau or are you Jacob? Uh, and he's disguising his voice and all this stuff, right? You know, he's got even more reaping to do because, you know, we see in his life, that he is deceived multiple times, probably worse than anyone here. And uh, if you wanted to turn to Genesis 29, we'll continue to see, you know, the, the third generation starting to reap the consequences that we can trace all the way back to Abraham again. And it says in Genesis 29, verse 18, it says, and Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And 29 verse 25 says, And it came to pass in the morning, that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this thou hast done unto me? Did I not serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? Well, maybe because you beguiled your dad. How about that, right? I mean, you just got, you know, you want to marry Rachel, the one you love, and then Leah, you know, she's looking out for number one. Laban's looking out for number one. He wants his first daughter to be married off. Leah wants you know, Jacob as her husband. So they both go in and they make sure that he's tricked to marry the wrong woman. I mean, that's just you reap what you sow, right? Well, I wonder if all this could have been avoided if Isaac didn't do what he did to Rebekah and then just go down. And I wonder if, if Isaac wouldn't have had to done what he did if he hadn't learned it from his dad. You can see how... The sins of the fathers are visited upon the third generation. Well, it doesn't stop here. You know, we're actually going to see it go further into the next generation because through this messed up marriage, you know, that he has, he ends up marrying Rachel and Leah, and, and he also has their handmaidens. So he has sons with all of them, right? And there's all this enmity going on between the fathers. He's got his favorite. He loves Joseph. That's his favorite. And all his brethren hate him. And they all want to kill him. They all want to kill Joseph. So they come up, you know, they, they start out trying to kill him. And then Judah comes along in, verse, in chapter 37 of Genesis. And I'll read this. In verse 26 of Genesis 37, it says, And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother in our flesh, and his brethren were content. So, and then in verse, uh, in verse 31 it says, And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Uh, know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. Okay, you know, so they, they go through this type of a charade again. They got his, they got their, his favorite son's coat. They just sell him. They lie about it and they say, oh, well, this kind of looks like, you know, Joseph's coat. So, you, you, you know, is it his or not? And then, you know, this is, you know, you, you can read here and, and Jacob is just, you know, very upset, you know. And he says, uh, and he knew it and said, it is my son's coat and evil beast that devoured him. Joseph it was without doubt rent in pieces and Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my, uh, unto my son mourning. Thus 
his father wept for him. So, you know, you see Jacob reaping. You know, he lied to his father Isaac. He's, he's, he's lied to by Laban and Leah and to marry the wrong woman. That's a, I mean, that's a pretty big deal. You know, you didn't, you know, you didn't let your father bless the son he wanted. Well, you don't get to marry the, the, the wife you wanted. You know, and then, and then it doesn't stop there because then he goes on and he's tricked by his children into thinking that his favorite son was killed. And, you know, so you see Judah. You know, Judah learns this same deception. You know, he's going through this whole charade. Hey, put the blood on his coat and show it to him. You know, similar to what Jacob did to his father. And, you know, and then later J uh, Judah is deceived. You know, he's, he has, you know, his own kind of messed up situation because, you know, you know, he's, you know, you can see how these guys are getting more and more wicked. And you can see how, you know, it's being taken to the next level each time. It's getting worse, it seems like. And then Judah's so wicked that he goes off, he marries some heathen Canaanite woman, and his son, Ur, you know, the Bible just says that Ur was wicked and the Lord slew him. And it doesn't really say why, but I wonder if it had anything to do with how messed up his dad was. Think about how messed up and wicked you'd have to be, you know, to lie to your father, make him think that his, your brother was killed. I mean... I wonder if Ur learned anything from his dad. And then God just you know, cut that off. And then Onan wasn't any better. And Tamar, you know, she was promised to just be you know, given this, his, his last son. And then you know, she ends up going through this whole charade to trick him. Or she dresses up like a harlot. And he ends up having sons by his, his daughter-in-law. I don't think he wanted that. I know I wouldn't want that. You know, so you can see how it, it, this, this has gone, you know, generation after generation. And you can trace it all the way back to Abraham. You know, so maybe we can look at stories like this and we can, we can realize the danger, you know, that, that is here. You know, we don't want our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and our great-grandson to be killed because of how wicked he is. So we need to maybe take heed before we just start thinking to just, we're going to have a practice. We're just going to plan on sinning. Because, you know, we all have sin, right? But there's a difference between, you know, having sin and then just planning to have, a, you know, sin. Because Abraham, he planned it. So, you know, whenever we go somewhere, we're going we're gonna to do this. Well, something else I'd like to point out. You know, another statement you could write down, you know, not, all, not, not only do the sins of the fathers are, oft, are often learned by the children or often taken to the next level by the children, the sins of the fathers are often transferred by the children. You might ask, well, what do you mean by transferred? Well, basically, not only will they repeat that sin or do that sin in a greater uh, amount or a greater excess, but they'll take that sin and they'll apply it in other areas. And basically, very similar areas but that are worse. For example, you know, we, see, we saw that story, but another example would be like Eli in the Bible and his sons, right? Eli, the Bible says, was a heavy man, right? And how do you get heavy? You eat a lot, right? You know, he, he, he was a uh, glutton. And his sons, Ophni and Phinehas, the Bible says that they, basically, they wanted to just eat this raw meat. You know, they were doing the sacrifices. They were priests. And whenever someone would take, uh, bring an animal to be sacrificed, they didn't want to cook it like it was supposed to be, like it was supposed to be done. They wanted to just take that raw meat and gorge themselves and just over, you know, indulge their their appetite, just like old dad, right? Well, they don't just stop there. They also so they had this sin of overindulging an appetite of the flesh, of 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 gluttony, right? And they take that, and the Bible says that they're also lying with all the women, right? So they're fornicators. So they have another appetite of the flesh that they can't control. And it's just something. That, so they take this lesson they learned from Eli, their father, of being a glutton, not knowing how to deny themselves. And they just transfer that over to being a fornicator. Another area, they're just not denying themselves, just not telling themselves no. And, you know, we know that they're sons of, the, sons of Belial. They were sons of the devil. And you know, the Bible teaches that these reprobates are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. I mean, that just shows you how dangerous the sin of gluttony is. And, you know, what are you teaching your kids, right? And look how they can just take it to the next level. And not only take it to the next level, but just, just transfer it in, a, in just worse area, right? So we need to, I mean, this is stuff we need to think about. Because the, the things you do and you show your children, 
I mean, what are they going to do with it? You know, you, we need to have a high standard for ourselves and raise the bar very high because the next generation often is going to be just below that. That's how. That's the trend. You know, that's why this statement of the third and fourth generation being, you know, cursed in that way. So, you know, it's important to realize this because a lot of people, I think, have children turn out away and they'll see them get into a certain sin that they never committed, they were never into, and they're like, I don't know how or how they turned out that way. And they just can't understand it or, 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 or don't want to understand it or whatever it might be. You know, whether it be overeating, let's say, you know, you know, you smoke cigarettes and your son turns out to be some kind of drug addict. Well, I wonder where they learned that from. It's like, well, yeah, I never did these hard drugs. I never did this stuff. Yeah, but you smoke cigarettes. And they just took that sin that you had, they just took it a little bit further. And they just got, you know, just worse, right? Or, you know, you know we looked at the, uh, the overeating, you know, the, the overindulgent and appetites, not being able to deny yourself. If you can't deny yourself... What makes you think your children are going to be able to deny themselves and some woman or some guy is trying to seduce them? What, what example do they have, right? Or, or what about this? You know, we look at the next, you know, we look at the generation nowadays and you've got a bunch of transvestites running around, a bunch of cross-dressing men, cross-dressing women or whatever. Well, I wonder where they learned that from. Well, you know, the Bible doesn't you know, talk much about you know, makeup. It talks about hair length. For women, they're supposed to have long hair. And men, they're supposed to have short hair. And it talks about hair length for men and women, having a difference. And it talks about a garment for men that's only for men, that women should never wear, and vice versa. A garment for women that men should never wear. That's, that's, and there's only one verse that talks about cross-dressing. It's Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. You know, if you wear that garment for a woman as a man, you're an abomination, you know, you're cross-dressing, and vice versa. Well... What, you know, and I'm not going to get into you know, what it is. You know, it's, pretty, it's common sense. Look at the bathroom sign of what the garment is. It's pants for men and it's dresses for women. You know, you're welcome if you didn't know. And <laughs> so you know, you got a generation going on where women are just wearing pants after, you know, all the time. They've got a short perm, you know, curly haircut, so it's okay, I guess, if it's short that way. But, and then the next generation, they just take it a step further. They, they're, they're, they're just, you know, just taking it to a weirder level. But in God's eyes, both are breaking the same command of cross-dressing and hair length. So that might make you think, you may, that, that, that can show you how bad things can get, right? Because once you cross the line and you're just, and you're just gonna wear, you're gonna cross-dress every day and it doesn't matter to you, well, don't be surprised that the next generation gets even weirder and takes it to the next level, right? You know, how about we not be a hypocrite? Right? So, you know, it just rings true that statement that I've heard often. You know, sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. Because that, that goes back to what I was saying earlier. You know, you don't realize the impact of your sin, or the ripple effects of your sin. You know, you, you drop a little rock in the water, and you got a ripple effects, and then three generations later, it's a tidal wave, destroying your great grandkids. You know, we need to think about that. Because um, no one wants, you know, hopefully no one wants their children and their grandchildren to be cursed, right? <laughs> that goes without saying. So what are some important applications that we can take from this? Yes, we understand this. Yes, we see this example. What are some important applications? Well, obviously, you know, be careful what you show and you teach your children, right? Proverbs 22, 6, again, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We need to remember that. We need to remember our responsibility as a parent and the power and the influence we have. It's not just what you do. It's what you consent to on an open level. You know, what you're, you know, by you know, putting it on your TV or whatever. Maybe you don't drink, but alcohol is on TV all the time. Everyone's drinking or everyone's fornicating on TV. And then you wonder why your kids grow up and they're fornicating and they're getting drunk. Well, I never did that. I, never, you know, I was a virgin when I got married. Well, what would you show them their whole life? How about you think about that, right? It shouldn't be a, a, a mystery. And again, you know, we cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. So this is the most obvious application as parents, right? And, you know, but there's, you know, there's another application, you know, because maybe you could say, well, I don't, I'm not a parent. I'm just a little kid. You know, what are you talking about for me or whatever? Right? Well, one day you'll be a parent, hopefully. But even now, 
a, as the child or someone who has had parents, you know, we can look at this and turn it around and say, be, you know, be careful what you have been taught and what you have learned and you've been shown your whole life. Because, see, whatever your parents have been into, whatever your, you know, your mom and your dad have been into, those sins that they have openly had, you're going to have a greater tendency of committing the same exact sin. Because you're just used to it. You're desensitized to it. To you, it's, it's been normalized. So you're going to, it's just going to be like you're part of your nature almost. You know, so if you know that your dad, uh, you, know, you know, we saw that verse about the angry man. If your dad is an angry man, well, you're, you're probably going to have a tendency to be an angry person because you just saw that your whole life. And, you, you know, if you recognize, you know, we should honor and respect and, you know, love our parents. But, you know, if we recognize something that they have wrong, you know, either while we're living in their house as a small child or as an adult that they, you know, something they did or have done, we need to be able to identify that according to God's Word and then say, you know what, I need to take double heed to that because I'm used to that. I'm probably going to fall into the same sin. You know, you know, the Bible says, you know, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You know, there's a, there's a danger in just being used to something. You know, another example of this, you know, you might have, you know, let's say you have a, a, a woman now who throughout her whole life, her mother was just, you know, very rebellious towards her husband or just disrespectful toward her husband and just, you know, despise him or whatever. And then, you know, and then she grows up and she realizes that, hey, you know, the Bible teaches that wives should be, submit, you know, submit unto their husbands and respectful of their husbands and all these things. Well, she needs to take double heed to herself because she's going to have a greater tendency of falling into that, right? And, you know, and everyone's parents has, you know, you know, different things or whatever. You know, we need to be able to, to look at our parents, and not just our parents, but our friends or our, our siblings, right? Because we don't want to allow that torch to be continued to the next generation, right? We don't want to teach our daughters or our sons the same sin, right? So we need to look at ourselves. What are we doing? What are we teaching the next generation? And what have we been taught? And are we doing the same thing? Because we don't want to do that which is wrong. You know, we want to you know, emulate our parents when they've done something right. And we have those things too. I know I do. But you know what? We all have this, the other, I'm sure. You know, uh, you might think, you know, well this, you know, this, wh where's the positive part of this message? You know, wh where's, the, where's the sweet part? Okay, well, here's the sweet part. Proverbs 12, verse 18. Uh, it says, There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Okay? So you might hear something sometimes that just, man, it just cuts through to your heart. Or it might just, just be negative or whatever. It might hurt to hear. But you know, it's actually health to you. If someone is warning you of something like this, something, uh, you know, of a danger that's present, right? And you can take hold of that, and you can get a hold of that, and you can apply it to your lives, and you can prevent your you know, future pain of your children or your grandchildren. I mean, that's health to you and the people you love the most. So that's the positive part, right? So in conclusion, we need to remember that the sins of the fathers are often learned by the children. Be careful what you're teaching them. Be careful what you're showing them, right? The sins of the fathers are often taken to the next level by the children. That's another danger. And the sins of the fathers are often transferred by the children, taken to a, a worse or a different area, but it's still the same old thing. All right? Be careful what you teach your children, and be careful what you've seen your whole life by your own parents or other people. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, thank you for this opportunity to preach. I pray that this would have been a blessing to people and that... They can get, we can get a hold of this and that the next generation could be uh, blessed by our example and that we could be like the father in Proverbs that says to our children, look and observe my ways. And uh, Jesus, name I pray.